Welcome, guys. Welcome to Sports Talk Soup. I'm Blair on Air with my favorite co-host, Vito Churico. And we're going to bring you guys some relevant topics in sports and other major headlines, Vito, right? Yes, we will. And uh, we're going to call this Sports Talk Soup for the time being. I hope you guys appreciate it, like it, respect it, all the above. You tell us what you think about it. And we're on Twitter at Vito Jerome for me. You're at Blair on Air. And I love that. It's so Thank catchy. You. Love Thank when something you. rhymes. And um, um, Michigan, to start off, let's start uh, talking about that. The national title game Monday night against the one-seeded Villanova Wildcats, who were much better, just wiped the floor with Michigan. And <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Vito. I hope you didn't cry too much. You being a oh, U of M alum, man. Blair Glover is a former attendee and a graduate of the University of Michigan. And it I must am. have been so darn tough for you last night, Blair. Well, I'm going to say this. Maybe it was a little tough, especially, I don't know anyone who likes to be way up here and then you just kind of plummet. That game felt like it last night, Vito. I think that the first, what, five minutes of the first half Mm -hmm. were strong. Defense was great. The spacing on the floor was great. Offensively, we seemed on fire. And then what happened? Well, I think the first five to seven minutes, Mo Wagner looked like the best player on the floor, at least for Michigan, as he should have been and had to play as. Thing is, he tailed off, and once he tailed off, U of M tailed off, and they couldn't keep up with Villanova and shooting the three ball. I mean, think about it. Those Nova Wildcats, all tournament long, could shoot the long-distance shot with efficiency. Michigan could not all game long. So despite Wagner's effort scoring 16 throughout the game, U of M just didn't have enough firepower to stay in that game really as the first half neared its end because you could say, like you said, the first five to seven minutes, Michigan was in the game, was able to hang there with Nova, respond to their punches. But by the end of the first half, it was kind of over already for Michigan, at least in my opinion, Blair. I mean, I think so, too. You could even see physically the expressions on the bench. You could see the towels wrapped around the face, the head drop. And at one point, even Coach, I mean, he was, you know, livid, it seemed like, with Wagner um, in the second half. And I'm thinking to myself, is he the only one that's responsible to win this game? At some point, you got to expect better guard play. You have to expect, expect less turnovers. All of those things... Uh, yeah, you know, go blue. I, I love. But it's hard team. to say go blue right now, a little bit. It was not hard to say go blue because I'll support them. But you got to tell the truth. You got to be truthful when you know those guys did look like. You know, the the weaker team. And where did Michigan's great D go? You know, Dante DiVincenzo of Nova scored 31 on 10 of 15 shooting off the bench for Nova. Mikel Bridges scored 19. Where was that defense on the perimeter that really made U of M, allowed U of M to make that great run, deep run to the finals? It wasn't there when MIA, right? <laughs> you had to search for it. You almost had to put, what, the image of Michigan and the defense on a milk carton or something to try to find it last night because it wasn't there truly all game long, allowing 79 points to Nova, who was a great team. And perhaps now, and we got to say it now, actually, the best team since day one of the tournament, at least, if not from day one of the regular season, Blair. Be nice to Michigan, please. I mean, we speak the truth. Congrats, Wildcats. We have to congratulate them. You're right. Congrats, Wildcats. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna act like they didn't win the national championship, but you could clearly see a size matchup deficit between the two teams. I, I. honestly watch the game and looking at them on television it looked like the JV versus the varsity <laughs> and I'm saying what's going on in, with strength and conditioning what what happens in that department I mean those guys clearly uh, overpowered Michigan in the paint well let me say this to you I don't want to offend you you being a U of M <laughs> slappy now but did Michigan benefit from not really playing anybody leading up to that national title game think about it no team did Michigan play that was a top five seed throughout the tournament until playing Nova, the one seeded Nova Wildcats. So, did U of M benefit from the relatively easy path to the national title game, Blair? Hmm. No, I'm not going to go home on that. Actually, the benefit was helping them to get to the championship. But uh, a great disadvantage when you talk about being prepared to play the championship game against such talent as Villanova. So, I mean, you got to speak the truth. You have to speak what's obvious. And that may have, have, um, it may have 
played kinda, a factor at least. Yeah, yeah, it, d- it definitely did play a factor in in how they played that championship game. It's like you got to be prepared for the marathon, not the sprint. So in the sprint, you could say is the first half of play. But once again, even at the end of the first half, you can say that Nova was by far the better team. You could tell also that Nova was pulling away, was ready to take off clearly in the second half, and it did. And Michigan had no way to respond to those punches being thrown by Nova whatsoever, who has now won two titles in three years. And Michigan still searching for his first one since 1989, I believe, before the Fab Five, before I was born. I'm a young lad here. Come on, guys. (laughs) So I haven't seen a national title victory from Michigan yet, who made it last, now recently in 2012-2013, losing to Louisville in a much better game. Highly contested and tight ball game there, where Michigan realistically could have won. And that Michigan squad player, in my opinion, was better, because it had some, I guess, blue chip-esque prospects that went on to the NBA, Trey Burke, uh, Mitch McGarry didn't become anything, but another NBA guy. For this team, it's all about Mo Wagner, and it looks like Blair to kind of seg into something else. He's going to leave for the league now. At least he should. Don't you think so? I definitely think he's a league player. There is no doubt in my mind that he can go to the league. Um, I mentioned earlier about development. So if he can get with the right trainers and really lock in this summer, he can get stronger uh, and you know work on some of the posts and perimeter moves, then definitely. I don't see a problem with it. I'm not going to say he's ready to walk into draft tomorrow and go on to a team the next day. There's definitely some development needed. And, um, hey, if you work hard, you can do it in, in a summer. You can do it. Work hard, play hard. We're trying to do that here on the first ever episode of Sports Talk Soup. I am Vito Jerome Turco, I like to say. And uh, Mo Vonder, I think, will definitely be better, by the way, than Mitch McGarry. I think McGarry was never going to be that great of an NBA guy. I think Mo Wagner can be a good NBA player, and I think he'll be picked in the top 15 of this year's, this summer's NBA draft. I love him. I love his style of play. He's very gritty. Um, So clearly we see he has the ability to lead the team. So I'm wishing the best for him, and I'm kind of on edge waiting to see. Is he going to go one more Mm -hmm. year, or is this the year that he comes out? I mean, Vito... Clearly, you th- you're you thinking it's happening. I'm thinking he's gone. And Charles Matthews, how about him now? Great perimeter guy, great wing player, 3 and D kind of guy, has some size. And he's a sophomore only, so maybe he does return. But I think he's gone perhaps as well. And that's another big loss right there for U of M if that does occur. Well, it's, it's really interesting this year. I mean, we've got a lot of players across the NCAA who I think we could say we expect it to declare for draft. But then there are kind of these, I don't know if you want to call them sleepers and people that are coming out. So I think it's going to be critical for the players to make the decision not only based upon their skill level, but based upon who they're going into draft with. You know, what's the competition like? Where is that going to place me in the ranking in comparison to everyone else coming out? And I've seen a lot of people declare yeah. um, over the last couple of weeks that I, some of them kind of sh- surprised by. Well, how about MSU's guys? Jaron Jackson Jr. just declared after a studly freshman season. You know, won the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year and Freshman Player of the Year. He's declared he's a top five NBA draft prospect, at least considered to be that by a lot of NBA draft pundits. Miles Bridges also gone, which was widely expected. But were you surprised at least a little bit by Jaron Jackson foregoing his sophomore campaign to enter the NBA draft this summer, Blair? Uh yeah, I mean I, I don't I don't doubt his ability to play, but yeah, Michigan State, you know, without me having said it before, that's one of those schools where I was completely surprised by the number of people they have going in draft. Miles, I expected it. Mm-hmm. Jaron was a surprise. Um can he do it? Yeah, sure can. I don't doubt it. So what does U of M, really quick, to kind of end this part of the show, right? What does Michigan have to do to now win a national title? Not to just be title fringe-worthy good, you know, in terms of being on the fringe of winning a national title but not being able to get over the, the hump. What will it take for Michigan to take that next step to actually win the national title the next time they do make it to the title game? I think um, everything starts with coaching, second recruiting, and then players. So from a coaching perspective, I 
think you go out and you mentioned earlier how they played kind of a soft schedule. They didn't have mm-hmm. to play as hard an opponent as Villanova until they got there. So maybe in some of the um, pre season games, some of those um, out of conference matchups, try to get some of those hardball t- uh, matchups in there. Obviously, recruits, you need some more guards. You need somebody who's going to be a knockdown shooter on Michigan. We have some guys that can do it, but I don't think have been consistent with it. So we've got a couple of guys here local. Um, and, Beto, you actually had the chance to sit down and interview some of those guys. So when you talk about new keys to the team and fit, I mean, wh- what is your take on that? Dave DeJulius, I think, is a stud going into his freshman year. Was a Mr. Basketball finalist playing at Detroit East English. Great senior campaign. Now, his team was one and done in the state playoffs, so sad but true for him because he's my guy. He was inside the podcast studio for the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. So, obviously, yeah, I love the guy. David. Big shout out to him, to the DSP Network. But, anyways, sure. Brandon Johns, too. From East Lansing High School, not going to MSU, which is a big surprise, right? He's right there in East Lansing, but going to Michigan. He's like a four-star guy, big man. So he brings a size. David DeJulius brings a point guard skills, a floor general ability. Not that he's going to start right away, obviously, as a freshman. But I see him contributing some significant minutes. And because of that, maybe Michigan has a class that's good enough to reinvigorate the program after losing some, you could say, star talent from this year's team. For sure. I think uh, both Michigan and Michigan State in in state rivalries you're definitely going to see a kind of another rebuild period in which pieces go where. Uh, so next year, I'm really excited about the matchup between the two teams and to see the development. It's kind of like starting all over again. And this is nothing new for college Mm-mm. athletics, but here – Both teams were coming from such great years to have to really rebuild multiple key pieces. It'll be interesting next season. The good thing really quick for State is that it's getting Foster Lawyer. Have you heard about him from Clarkston? The Mr. Basketball winner, actually. So, And he deserved it big time. Great handles, ball skills, shooting ability, floor general ability. Now you have Cassius more than likely coming back. Yeah, but, Cash, Cassius hasn't announced anything. And I don't and, think he'll uh, go. I don't think he yeah. should, Blair. What do you think about that? Um, I think that the he hasn't announced and everyone else has. I think he's going to stay. If he does, he's making the best decision for himself. Um, and I think it'll be good. You need some type of senior leadership on the team. So if he stays to take that on, then, you know, my applause to him. I support him all the way. So I think I think he could use another season in. So from the hardwood to the hardball Mm -hmm. game, which I love. I played it growing up, Major (laughs) League Baseball, talking about the Tigers, and I want to make this statement clear really quick here about the Tigers. I think I have a better chance of landing a date off of Tinder than the Tigers do winning more than 75 (laughs) games in 2018. Woo, I had to go there early on. That's here. okay. We may have to keep up with those stats. You let me know. We we may have to do like a check in, a one minute check in on each episode to see what happens in comparison to the Tigers stats. Mm-hmm. I think so. That'd be cool. And you know what? I'm a Tigers fan at heart, and I do a Tigers podcast. I want the best from them. The thing is, Blair. I mean, they look like a 68 to 70 win ball club, maybe 75, but that's really predicated upon whether or not Miguel Cabrera bounces back, Victor Martinez. Jordan Zimmerman, guys like that. Well, here's the thing. You know, I will watch any sport because Mm -hmm. I love sports in general. Baseball, I don't watch as much. But the one thing that I'm hoping is that the team understands that they're not going to get a do-over like opening day. Our do-overs are done, so we got to go out, play each game for the win. Um, Clearly going to have some struggles with the changes in the offseason, but I don't know. We're going to see what happens. Did you have a chance to go out to opening day, see the crowd? In the ballpark or anything? I did not. Now, I've been there before, but you know, opening day, it's more about the event, the festivities surrounding the ballpark, than actually going to the game and taking in the ball game and actually watching it intently. Sad but true about fans and what they're like come opening day. And it's probably anywhere, all 30 Major League Baseball clubs. But for the Tigers, for sure, it's it's a unofficial holiday, isn't it? (laughs) It's a fun way to start off the season, to start off spring, really. But it's been bad outside, horrible weather. You had opening day cancel, moved to Friday of last week. Mm -hmm. You had two games on Sunday because of a rainout on Saturday afternoon. And that Easter Sunday, you had like nobody at the ballpark, Blair. 
So, Vito, before we move into that scene at the ballpark, I just want to ask you, two games in one day, is that healthy? I mean, what, is that a normal procedure? Because it seems like there's already so much wear and tear throughout the season and rotator cuff issues, things yeah. of that sort. I mean, is that a good call to have two games in one day? I heard it was the earliest double header, at least in Tigers history, if not in Major League Baseball history. And by the way, their opening day played on Friday instead of Thursday because of the inclement weather. They played a 5-hour and 27-minute game, the longest opening day in Major League Baseball history. Wow. How about that? Wow. But now to answer your question clearly, I would say it's not great early on in the season before the weather's nice. And it's just... it's. Not great weather to start off a season and playing baseball. You would much rather start off the season in a warm climate area, going to Miami for the Marlins, somewhere out mm-hmm. west, California, the L.A. Dodgers, L.A. Angels of Anaheim. And why can't Major League Baseball have all the teams start off, you know, in a warm climate? That'd be nice. I mean, as a fan, I mean, if you're a diehard baseball fan, do you actually go to these games when there's, what is it today, like 39 degrees, it's Horrible. cloudy, a little bit rain? Yeah. Do you go and you sit in the seats? I mean, what was Easter Sunday? What was that crowd like? I heard they sold like 18,000 plus tickets, but guess what? There weren't even close to 18,000 people inside of Comerica Park on Sunday for either of the doubleheader games. So, and then 610 was the second of the two games. Think about that. 6-10 on Easter Sunday. Who the heck is going there on <laughs> Easter Sunday, right? When you have your family and friends around you. And the Tigers have a lackluster product. And the weather was horrible on Sunday. So then, I'm just going to tell you. I'm at home eating dinner. I am. I don't I'm blame you. I'll eat out. my ham, spaghetti, whatever it may be. <laughs> I mean, what do you eat, by the way, on Easter? Um, Actually, this Easter, I ate poorly not poorly in choice but poorly poorly I didn't have much of a choice if I had an ideal Easter I'll eat some greens from my grandmother nice. some cornbread and that's actually enough for me that's that would have been great but I didn't even have that option See, my mom's Italian, and poor you. I feel bad for you. You know, my mom can always maybe make some spaghetti or something. I mean, see, I love that about my mom. And when Mm -hmm. we have Easter, we always do. It's like an annual tradition now, year in, year out, have an Easter at my parents' house. Mm -hmm. She'll make her spaghetti, which is like pasta, pasta, depending on whether you're from northern Italy or southern Sicily. So it's really weird in terms of that. But it's great (laughs) food, and I love my Italian home-cooked meals. Can't beat it, Blair. Well, then you should have invited me over maybe one of these days. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to figure that out. Or just bring me like a little a little carryout. A little sample yeah, a little to try sample out. so I can try it. Yeah. That'd be great. That'd I think be great. You'll, I think you'll like it, Blair. We'll have to make that happen. Yeah, or we could really mix it up, and you could bring me some, and we can go to a ball game. Once there we go. the weather warms up. We'll have to check it out. I would say more like in May. How about that? Because April, you don't even know good. what you're going to get here in Michigan. How about out east? Did you see snow over there, too? Oh, Again, for like man. the, what, the hundredth time? By now. I don't understand what's going on. I I know there are some people who don't believe in global warming and climate change, and they don't believe that as humans we affect the environment. I believe we do. Yes, we do. Um, You know, you guys, stop littering. Summer's coming up. You're going to parks. Clean up. Throw your stuff away. Plastic bottle covers. You know, clip those things before you trash them. It's crazy the weather we're having now. I can't believe it. It is April 2nd now, and it's only about 39 degrees, if that, rainy and cold. But guess what? We're inside. We're talking about sports. We can talk about what we love to talk about. That makes it so much better. (laughs) But something I don't like is the weather, is global warming, but it is true. It does exist. Another thing I don't like that I want to kind of end this week's edition of the show on is Sinclair Broadcast Group now telling its broadcasters, its news anchors from station to station. By the way, this Sinclair Broadcast Group is the owner and operator of 173 stations throughout the United States. So having that large of control over news content throughout the U.S., and it's been telling its news anchors, Deadspin just came out with an article, a montage of these clips of these news anchors reading out the same exact script, and it's kind of promoting this, not to get all political here, but this pro-Trump propaganda. And when he's controlling what you're putting out, or somebody a higher up is, you lose all your editorial control then it's no longer an official, effective, journalistic, journalistically ethical newscast. That's all out the window, Blair. So, Vito, do you feel like the 
message that they were trying to convey the the message that they were trying to stand up for having better media having uh, media that's a little more police in essence they feel like other media companies are taking things and they're putting them out before they investigate what the actual facts are do you feel like that they're actually as as a company to give their employees a script of what to say do you feel like they're doing the same thing they're speaking out against i think it's journalistically speaking it's an injustice it's journalism injustice if there ever was such a thing. And I think, yeah, because they're trying to get rid of the anti-Trump media crowd, right? But then promoting a pro-Trump crowd and saying that he does no wrong is also not right, correct? And there's been this fake news, and I've got to get your opinion really quick here, too, about fake news that he's just created, and it's been this whirlpool of it. It's just ludicrous to me, and all it adds up to is that if he doesn't like you and your coverage of him, it's fake news. That's not right either. No, I mean, I'm pretty fair in regards to that. You know, there's the whole freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. This is the country we live in. And I agree with, if you speak bad on me, that's not proper news i mean the truth is the truth is the truth sometimes it's good sometimes it's ugly and sometimes it's bad it's sometimes somewhere in between so i think and, and i'm just gonna back up a little bit and, and there may be people who disagree with me but when you represent a company right um or just a company in general and then you have a a publicist and a pr person you have a person who's there for crises management within pr the president themselves whether this one or prior presidents they have people who write them speeches we don't really have a problem if someone writes that speech and it sounds great we don't have a problem with someone writing the speech in general so i'm saying with the news station coming out with scripts for their employees I don't necessarily to convey a single message about their organization I don't necessarily see a problem with that in itself because you want to make sure that the message is um, consistent across the board no matter which a newscaster or reporter is giving the message so I'm okay with a message being tailored to say Hey, and and I'm saying across the country, all of my employees, you will read this message to say this is what we represent as a company. Now, obviously, they're they're not slaves. So if they disagree with it, then maybe, you know, they say I don't want to. And then that's a whole other thing. to That figure is an out. issue there then, too. Yeah. You, you know, they have to figure that out. I'm not saying the person should be fired. I don't know what happens then, but I am OK with a consistent message being prepared for employees of a company that's going to represent that company. If the message is meant to be inclusive and meant not to be offensive to someone. So on face value because you sent you sent me the article and when I listened to what they were saying if I took the Trump propaganda out if I took the fact that they were in any type of relation or support of Trump or anyone if I just listened to the message then I think it was okay for all the employees to consistently have a message that says hey as a company this is what we represent this is what we believe in And quite honestly, from a journalistic viewpoint, you should only put out information that you've researched and have been able to prove uh, prove is fact. Now, it gets twisted when, like you said, you start adding in elements of we're putting this message out because other people are putting messages out against the president that we support. I don't think that part's right. See, if you're controlling the message, you're taking an individual's First Amendment rights away, the right to free speech, to speak his or her mind. That's where I have the problem and draw the line and say it's unfair, it's non-journalistically ethical, and you're ruining that newscast and the credibility of that newscast as well. 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, you if you take the opportunity for them to have their own voice, it is a problem. Um, I don't agree with that. And I'm actually looking up to see if I can find that link because I would like to read what what the statement actually said. And I'm sorry, it's going to take me a moment. But if you could speak to, do you kind of remember or can you quote exactly what was said within that? Because well, I kind of feel like, you know, maybe I need to look at it again to fully address what's going on. But on my end, I felt like it was a basic message, but one could only imply that they were supportive of Trump. Yeah, and because it was pretty much, maybe not directly stated, but it inferred throughout that said script that in this age, in this era of fake news. Mm -hmm. And see, he pretty much created that phrase. Now, we okay. knew there was some fake news. Mm -hmm. But it's like when Kellyanne Conway, I don't know if you heard about this, she brought up alternative facts. Okay. <laughs> uh, there aren't alternative facts. That's not right either. Mm. So you got to take a stand somewhere. That's just where I'm taking a stand. And I don't think it makes me a uh, Democrat or Republican. It's just journalistically speaking, when you're running a broadcast, a newscast, those newscasters, those are journalists. They're paid to report the truth, the facts as newscasters, as reporters. They can't be biased one way or the other. And when you start being biased one way and too much without actually or while spreading well, fake news, I guess. Well, you lose all your credibility, right? Yeah. And then there is that media bias that is established mm -hmm. and that becomes prevalent and takes over your news station and your newscast completely. Yeah, I'm scrolling through it, and I agree with with um, pretty much most of the statements you made. And I'm, I have the script here, and it, it kind of does, on, on second look, it is like, why are you putting this out? If your duty is to provide news that is unbiased, you fact check and so and so, then why not just focus on that? Here at, uh, what is it, KOMO, this is what we focus on. We're glad we have you as our viewership, blah, blah, blah. But instead, the message was written to highlight kind of so as to give a jab at other networks that put this fake news out. Supposed fake so, news like CNN. President Trump has yeah. called out CNN mm -hmm. numerous times for being fake news. Yeah. But CNN has been a responsible, ethical news station for how long? For many, many years. And just because they attack Trump doesn't make them fake news all of a sudden, right? And yeah. that's where I take the stand and think that it's just not right when this is being the case where a higher up's telling you what to say directing you to say this or that and it sounds like it's a dictatorship then you know no authority figure a higher up at one of these stations nor the president should be telling these people what to say when to say it as well well, Vito, I don't know if we want to end on this point, but I have a feeling we're going to have to end on this point because it may get too deep. And a lot of people, you know, this is a touchy subject. It is. But based upon everything you said, then do we go back to the Colin Kaepernick thing to which a company says, OK, you don't have to not only speak a certain script, but you have to act out a certain way. I mean, is is that the same thing? I you have know. to adhere to these strict policies and standards that are handed down by your company NFL team, as in the case of Colin Kaepernick. I mean, what is your stance on that? Should we just oblige and bow down to our higher-ups all the time, even if we know it's not right? That's the thing, Blair. Well, I think that it's definitely something we can discuss in our next episode. I won't shy away from the topic, um, but like I said, time won't allow us to no, get into it. No, not for today. It. It's too deep of a subject. It, it won't allow us to get into it, but just based upon your words, your view and breakdown of KOMO's you know, uh, sending out a letter that every, a script that everyone has to read if that begins to feel like a dictatorship, because there are a lot of people who I've had discussions with about different topics, Colin Kaepernick in particular, mm -hmm. and they say if it's a company's policy, you, when you sign on, you're not obligated to work for the organization. So when you sign on as a news journalist, somewhere in that contract clearly has to state that at some point someone can give you a script to read. Mm. And if you get the script and you don't read it, 
then what happens? Then you're fired. Do they have the right to fire you? Because you, you know what? Is... I think when they're firing you, it does look shoddy, though still on the company's part. Now, I guess they can based on the contract, because that could be a breach of the contract right it... now. But with Colin Kaepernick, was there that in there, in the language of the contract about kneeling, not kneeling? I have don't think so, though. Have we ever seen that? Because that's the biggest debate ever. People say, like I said, I'm, I'm not saying which side of the argument I'm on. I'm mm-hmm. saying different sides I've heard and with all of that have we ever seen anything that says you must have your body positioned in a certain way during the national anthem and your hand on the heart or something I don't think so but you're right that's a very good point I don't think we know that but I think some NFL players especially nowadays after what's happened in the backlash if they saw that in a contract guess what they would do they would rip it apart and throw it into the garbage can don't you think so at this point a lot of them if they had the personal power and pull, meaning if they had a name in the league built up. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very important behind it to to say if they had a name in the league and certain power, obviously. I mean, but for some people, it's going to come down to if they have enough checks, if they have enough money saved in the mm-hmm. account, and how much they're going to lose. And that is where you look at the moral part of things. That is where you look at an athlete maybe like Kaepernick who says it doesn't matter how much I'm going to lose financially I'm going to stand for what I believe is right and everyone trust me they do not have that they don't have that mindset they may act like it they may portray it but you never know until it comes down to the money for some people and that's the thing, money talks in any industry and I think you're right if you have the pull personal power because of well an money made over the years checks that you cash then well you then you say, might hey, you might say anything you right? know who you know what's funny and and i hate to it, it kind of has nothing to do with it but just kind of jumping off topic a little bit stan van gundy when they asked him what was gonna happen at the end of the season and you know how he was feeling about that and um you know whether or not he's gonna stay as a head coach you know what he was able to say I'm not like some of these young guys out here, you know, like I, I don't have any children to raise. He, he's good, basically. He's going to be good. So if he were fired at the end <laughs> of the season, he's going to be a OK. He's now, making a threat to fire me. I have nothing <laughs> to lose. And you're right. It's about the checks that you've accumulated over the years in his defense or in his case, let's say. Yeah, he's comfortable. Yeah. I mean, he's had a great career up until this point. And, you know, whatever he does after, he'll be fine. So you can kind of be comfortable when you're when you've kind of, you know, your bank account looks good and, and your work speak for speaks for itself over the years. He's got a lot of experience, a lot of connections. He'll be fine. So when you're winning, you can speak your mind no matter what. Look at Coach Pop. Greg Popovich with the San Antonio Spurs, Steve Kerr with the Golden State Warriors. They won all the time, it seems like, so they can speak their minds openly, willingly, and not be shunned or receive some backlash. Stan Van Gundy, because the Pistons have been losing a lot more than they've been winning, as you know, Blair, he gets the uh, criticism and the backlash because of that. Now, if they were winning, I think the, the story and the narrative, let's say, Blair, would be different for Stan Van Gundy. Yeah, I think so, definitely. Um, I mean... When I had a chance to sit into the press conference, his biggest thing was, and I appreciate Sam Van Gundy because he does not shy away from the media. He lets you know what he's thinking, and and you got to appreciate that out of a guy. And he basically said they were just trying to focus on finishing the season, and he appreciated ownership for understanding that that's what he was trying to do as a coach, and they'll deal with it in the offseason. So I admire him for having that mindset as well. I mean, you you know, it's it's a lot of pressure to have to think about whether or not you're going to actually have a job and still be expected to do your job. So I think he balances that well. And um, I don't know. That's definitely a, de- a developing story here on the Detroit scene, Vito. We're going to have to bring it back up, and we're going to have a lot to talk about with these guys. And guess what? After he's done with the Pistons or in the NBA, he has a media career ahead of him. So another reason why he has like nothing to lose if he gets ousted by the Pistons. Well, all I could say is he's very entertaining to me, so I wouldn't mind seeing him out there on he'd television. He'd be good at it. <laughs> in the TV booth, in the studio, he'd be really darn good. Mm-hmm. I'd say so. So, Vito, what what can our audience look forward to? What are we are we coming back? What's going I on? I hope so. I hope they bring us back, allow us <laughs> back inside these studios. I think we were nice enough, respectable enough, and entertaining enough at least, and we're open to debate. 
not that we embrace it completely or hot takes, but we're willing to debate some non-sports topics even. And I guess you'll get some of that and a lot of sports on every single episode of Sports Talk Soup if we're going to continue to call it that moving forward. Vito, I'm okay with that. Sports Talk Soup is fine with me. I definitely look forward to more time with you, more time with you guys out there. But for today, I think we're going to wrap up. And this has been our first episode of Sports Talk Soup. I'm Blair on Air. And I'm Vito Churko at Vito Jerome on Twitter. Thank you much, guys, for tuning in. At Blair on Air 1 on Twitter. Thanks, guys.